today's webinar, Social Media and Online Reviews. How do they affect your brand and power score? My name is Marlene Kerbin, and I'm a co-producer at Plain English Healthcare, publishers of eHealthcare Strategy and Trends and Strategic Healthcare Marketing, and producers of the eHealthcare Leadership Awards. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Hospital marketers know that you have to be active on social media and online review sites, but who is it for and how do you do it well? In today's webinar, you'll learn the answers to WAC Custom Communications' latest national consumer survey and a new descriptive statistics, statistic WAC has developed called the Power Score to help you determine your rank against the competition. Our presenters for today's event are Amanda Harriman and Craig Fairfield. Amanda, the marketing manager for WAC Custom Communications, is the agency's very own Swiss Army knife, one of those unusual people who is almost equally right and left brain. That means she brings to WAC a balanced blend of creative and analytical thinking, along with a unique perspective, a background in healthcare digital marketing, and a degree in health services. She spends much of her time digging through marketing analytics, demographic, and psychographic data, and GIS mapping for clues and insights to help the WAX team dream up omni-channel marketing strategies and healthcare advertising campaigns that motivate and inspire healthcare consumer decisions. Craig Fairfield is Managing Director at WAX. He has managed award-winning marketing programs for an impressive array of national and regional healthcare organizations. He holds degrees in international business, business administration, and marketing from McKendree University in St. Louis, where he has taught in the School of Business. Craig has experience on both the agency and client side as a strategist, researcher, and writer specializing in healthcare communications. Today's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A. To submit questions, type them into the control panel and hit send. We'll hold questions until the end, but please feel free to submit them at any time. At the conclusion of the webinar, we'll send attendees an email with a link to the presentation slides. Also, the session is being recorded. You'll receive a link to access the webinar recording as soon as it's been processed and is available for viewing. And now I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Amanda Harriman. Amanda, please go ahead. Thank you, Marlene, and welcome. We're happy to be back for another segment with Strategic Healthcare Marketing. And a big thank you to everyone who registered and is here today with us. For those who are tuning in for the first time, we are Wax Custom Communications, and we're known as monsters in healthcare marketing. We are winners of 1,500 awards, and we are located in Miami, Florida, a full service agency with over 30 years of experience. Monsters in Healthcare Marketing, that sounds cool. And it's Halloween week too, right? <laughs> so it couldn't be any more appropriate than, uh, than this week to have this spooky slide. Uh, yeah, we're Wax, I'm Craig. And uh, a lot of times we have people ask us, okay, so you're Wax and you're Monsters, but what's different about Wax? What, what makes you guys special? It's an interesting question, and without belaboring it too much, um, the things that we think make us special is that we're challengers, we're productive challengers, we're curious and we're skeptical about things. We almost never take anything at face value. And if somebody says to us, you have to do this this way or everybody else does it that way, so that must be the right answer, um, we're probably gonna, gonna ask, well, is that true? We like to challenge the status quo instead of just taking uh, people's word for it. We also insist that everything we do be two things. It has to be beautiful because we're a creative agency. So we want the things we make to be fantastically attractive and beautiful experiences. And it has to be smart because we know that beautiful things that are not strategic are pointless and strategic things that aren't beautiful, that don't have any stopping power, that don't have any elegance are, are also pointless. So we want everything that we do and we make to be effective and be results driven. So we're skeptical um, and we're curious. So when we don't know the answer to a question, we generally dig in, we try to find out more. And that's how we got to this study that we're gonna to talk to you about today. Um, people ask us often about social media and about online reviews and lots of other things that are happening in the digital world. They wanna know 
how important are these things for their brand, their hospital, their health system, uh, their healthcare product? How important is social media? How important are these review sites? Do we have to do these things? And the truth is, I don't know. We didn't know. We wanted to find out um, because these things are expensive, right? They can be a big hassle right. Got to manage your social media. Somebody's got to keep an eye on that. What time of day do we post on what channels? Who's going to make all this content? Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. Uh, and you have to manage comments. It's a lot to keep track of. So people want to know, do we have to do it? Absolutely. Do we? Do we have to do it? Let's find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So like he said, rather than assuming, we just went straight to the consumer. And so we asked this question, you, do you have to be active on social media and online review sites? We think that the answer is yes. We assume it all the time. Everybody says it must be true, right? Right. Yeah. So we went and we said, no, let's find out. Let's ask people. Um, let's ask the consumer. And so what we did was design a online survey um, and we used SurveyMonkey. We purchased a panel that they uh, have offered you know, online and uh, crafted the survey and sent it out nationwide. We wanted to make sure we were gonna be statistically significant. So we chose to send this to 500 respondents. This gave us a 4% margin of error with a 95% confidence level. And the things that we wanted to find out are, um, how do consumers, healthcare consumers, interact with hospitals and health systems on social media? What channels do they use? What kind of content is valuable? Um, what how does it affect their perception of hospitals and, and healthcare in general? What are the popularity of different kinds of review sites? And we were interested in, uh, are there differences across different types of people in different places? Right. So with that in mind, we wanted to make sure that the data was gonna be evenly distributed across both geography, regional, and demographics. So this is a good illustration here of how well balanced across the US um, our respondents are. Pretty even. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were able to cross tabulate the information. Why? Well, tabulation allows us to really look into and dig into the data and identify the trends and the outliers, ident identify the who, the what, and the where's, um, and really find those nuggets that we're all looking for. Yeah, we know from experience that uh, trends are important. You want to understand the trends so you can ride those. But the really interesting stuff often happens on the fringes, right? The the outliers, the things that, that we didn't expect to happen. If you can find those and understand them, often you can find an opportunity there too. So we're always curious about that. Right, and just like we do micro segmentation across our messaging and our platforms and our audiences, we want to make sure that we can tie this in, this data to those segments. So we went and made sure we had a nice even distribution between gender. We had household income and age that we also made sure to have a nice distribution with, um, and we were able to achieve that. Are these the real people from the study? Some of them, I yeah, believe. Hey, good looking bunch. <laughs> That was not a requirement. Just <laughs> <laughs> so let's find out what we learned. Yeah. Um, so what did we learn? Let's talk about social media first, kind of in a general sense. And then we'll talk about how important social media is for hospitals and healthcare decisions. And remember, the question we really want to answer for people initially is, do we have to do this stuff? Do we have to pay attention? Well. I'm going to tell you, yes, yes, we have to do this. <laughs> of course. Oh. <laughs> so we started out with this general question. So do you have an account on any of the following social media channels? We wanted to lay the foundation to really understand the audience's preferences without going into hospitals or health systems specific uh, right off the bat. And we were able to identify some trends. Um, not a big surprise. We have top three. Uh, preferred channels, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, not really surprising. Um, we did come up with some insights that were interesting. 62% uh, of the Instagram users, users were female, 75% of Pinterest users are female, and 67% of the Snapchat users are female. So that's interesting, but is it important? It is when you're looking at how you're going to create those messages and who's out there, specifically also considering we are in the healthcare industry and we already know that females are the majority and when they make decisions for healthcare in their household. 
So this is something important to know that they are out there. They are the majority on these different platforms. And another nugget in there is that not only um, looking at gender, but looking at age. Um, on Snapchat, not surprising, again, 51%, half of the people who are using Snapchat are between the ages of 18 to 29. Um, you know, we, we already know that in the back of our heads, that's a younger audience. But Pinterest, not only is it a majority female audience, but it's also 40% between the ages of 45 to 60. Hmm. So it skews older than the other ones. Right. That's something to keep in mind when you start crafting some of this content. Yeah, um, and, and it's also a nice illustration of how important it is if we have to do this, and it sounds like we do, if we have to do the social media thing, how important it is to have the right kind of message and the right kind of content on the right channels. Um, I, I went and looked at Pinterest after we started breaking this data down, and I saw some things that I didn't really expect. I'm not uh, female, and I'm also not active on Pinterest. So I wondered, well, like, what would people use Pinterest for that's related to health? If you just put health or healthcare or health and wellness into the search engine, you get thousands of responses, thousands of pins, and a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't have imagined. There's healthy cooking recipes and health tips, of course, but there were, uh, there were handy checklists. Like if you're going in for a scheduled C-section, here's 20 things you should have in your, in your go bag. So people are using it for really interesting things. Wow, yeah. And so keeping that in mind, so when looking at the channel, you realize it's a more of a visual channel. It's a little different than some of the other platforms um, that we use a little more heavy. Um, also, what you do on those channels, how you use them is important to know. So when you think about advertising versus doing organic content, uh, Pinterest generally uh, is not a preferred advertising channel just because you do have a smaller audience. It's not as robust as Facebook, Instagram, um, but for organic, for creating content and putting it up, if it's visual, like Craig just said, things that, that are already on there that people are already using, pinning recipes and lifestyle kind of things, that might be something that, that it can work for you. And there's, there's one channel that's uh, kind of not on here that a lot of people might not know about, uh, but it's the kind of thing that we need to keep an eye on. Like a few years ago, Snapchat probably wouldn't have made this list because people thought of it just, if they thought of it at all, they thought of it as just a place where teenagers and preteens go and, and mess around, play around, you know, make things and put it up there for their own entertainment. Now it's become a very legitimate platform. So the one I'm talking about is the latest breaking one, which is called TikTok. TikTok. You know TikTok. We went to TikTok <laughs> together the other day. Um, that's uh, one that's up and coming with that, that younger demographic, which we're going to find out in a minute, is a very important audience. Absolutely. You know the main thing that they're doing on TikTok right now? No. Making fun of old people. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, surprising, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't even know about TikTok if it wasn't because my 10-year-old is using it. <laughs> <laughs> is he making fun of old people? Um, I hope not. Probably, yeah. Maybe, I guess. So no surprise. <laughs> people use social media. Uh, they use it for fun. They use it to stay in touch with each other. And they do use it to get answers to questions. But do they use it when they're thinking about what hospital to, to choose or about health plans or about health care decisions? Let's talk about social media as it relates to hospitals. So now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty specific to who is following social media pages relating to hospitals? So this question is very specific. It says, do you follow your hospital on social media? Um, I thought that was a pretty high bar when we created this study. I wondered, does anybody really follow their hospital in social media? First, it requires you to identify with a hospital in particular, like, yes, that's my hospital. Uh, a lot of us live in cities where there are lots of hospitals. so. That seemed like a kind of a stretch to me. And then, like, why why would you do this unless you work there? But a surprisingly high number, to me anyway, of people say they do follow their hospital on social media. 18% uh, of people said that. And again, we see here 63% of those who said yes are also female. Um, that's usually a trend when it comes to healthcare. Uh, but another interesting factor was that the largest group to respond yes was within the ages of 18 to 29. So now we have that younger generation 
on social media, not just on it, but following hospitals. It's still only 18% though that follow the hospital. So maybe we don't have to do this thing, right? No, so. we do. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> so we go and shift here to find out, well, okay, now we know people follow, they don't follow, but why are you following? What is the main reason you follow your hospital on social media? If you do, of the 18%, the next question they got was this one. What is the main reason you follow your hospital on social media? What is the reason? Well, there's we had a good spread here of different things that we feel, you know, we create content for and we wanted to lay it out and find out what is more attractive. And not surprisingly, you do have more of the news and lectures and, uh, you know, those are the top two. But my favorite piece of this uh, insight is that while leaving reviews, writing or leaving and communicating on via messenger did not make the top two those who answered within those two categories um, were majority 80 to 29 years old right and that's pretty interesting it's interesting and it's useful too it's important to understand so if we do have to do this thing and it sounds like we do who's it for um, it, it's for this this younger generation right because everything else that they do they're used to doing it probably on their phone. You know, we think of this as an internet thing and it is internet based, but the way that this audience is accessing this information is predominantly with the phone that's in their hand. They do everything else on their phone. So why wouldn't they expect to be able to interact with their, their healthcare provider, their hospital system, whatever it is that they're doing on their phone, they pay their bills on the phone, they manage their bank account, they keep in touch with their friends, they can book a restaurant, they can get a car to pull up and take them to that restaurant. They can pay each other back for things. Um, I've had to get I've had to get hip with Venmo, for example, <laughs> because uh, my kids. For those of you who are listening in, I have kids in their 20s, and that's the only way that they that they bank. That's the only way they do things. Is and there other ways? Sometimes, <laughs> right? <laughs> sometimes when you have kids in their 20s, sometimes they they need a little extra cash. <laughs> and if you're not standing there next to them or you don't live in the same city with them, the only way to communicate that cash is is to use Venmo. Okay. So this audience is is 100 percent using their phone for everything else. Why wouldn't they expect to be able to leave reviews, to read reviews and to communicate? They want to communicate and they want to do it in a way that's convenient for them. And this is by far the most convenient way for them to do it. Yeah. And if, if you notice just those keywords, communicate these these two uh, answers that they that they answered most for are ways that offer a two-way engagement. You know, you're not just reading something, you're not just learning about you know an upcoming lecture or workshop, but you have the ability to engage with your hospital and write a review, communicate instantly via messenger. So back to the idea of trends versus outliers. Uh, those top two bars are more like trends. You know, people in general, if they follow their hospital, they're trying to keep up with what's going on there or they're trying to get access to some kind of information through a class or a lecture or an event that they want to go and attend. The people who are a little bit more of the outliers are this younger audience, um, but they're coming on strong, right? Yeah, absolutely. And why is this important? Even though right now you may not be thinking about that younger audience um, as the priority, but you have to think about as as we evolve and time continues, this this is the audience that's going to saturate the market and eventually become they're going to change the market. Yeah, for sure. The 18 to 29 year olds, they don't use a lot of healthcare now in general, um, but they're going to they're going to need it. And soon a lot of them are starting families. Uh, their lives are about to change fundamentally. And over the next eight to 10 years, they're going to affiliate with a hospital or a health system and they're going to they're going to decide which brands and which places are for them. Uh, you want to get them you want to get them quick. You want to get them early and this is how you do it. So we just learned not everybody actually follows social media for hospital, but if they're not following, they're still going on social media, right? They're still searching on social media and they're still learning and finding you there. So we wanted to understand from that perspective um, what are they doing? Where are they? Because even though 82% of them do not follow, um, they're still finding you. So let's see. Yeah. So of the people who, who do follow the 40% who do, um, 
we, we understand some things about them. We want to know now what social media channels do you use to learn more about hospitals specifically? We know a lot of people are on the internet. We know a lot of people are on these social media channels. So we ask everybody, which social media channels do you use to learn more about hospitals? Uh, you can see that the, the largest group said, I don't use social media to learn about hospitals. More than half of people, what is that? About 60% of people. But that skews toward this older audience. The 45 to 60 age group was by far the most likely to say they don't use social media to follow. What about the other ones? Right, so when you go back and look at the ones that are using social media to find you and learn about you, when you look at YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of those channels, about half of them, fall within that 18 to 29 year old range. So again, we're seeing a trend here. It's, it's common across the board here. Okay, so people are using social media to varying degrees and different people are in order to find, but what do they want when they, when they go online looking for information uh, to social media or anywhere? So we asked this specific question, and we asked this of everybody, whether they said they use social media to find out about hospitals or not. We wondered, in general, what should a hospital post on their social media channels? Even the people who uh, say they don't use social media to learn about hospitals, they might have an opinion about this, and, and that might be, might be a useful insight to get, right? Especially to attract new followers, because maybe they don't use it now, but maybe they would if the right kinds of things were up there. And we found out that uh, by far, the things that they were looking for fall pretty cleanly into two categories. They want information, either about the hospital or about some, some thing about that's it. happening, mm -hmm. uh, or they want validation. So they're trying to decide what hospital or what health system to use, and they're looking around to figure out which one seems like a good fit for them. So information and validation seem like the two things to focus on. Mm -hmm. There was another very interesting uh, piece of information that we figured out looking at the very small group that said others. Um, there was a trend in there. <laughs> yeah. If they did not choose one of these uh, options up there, almost everybody that said other said that they do not care or nothing at all. In other words, they didn't believe the hospitals should be on social media. And they literally said that. Uh, quite a few of them said, I don't think hospitals should be on social media. I think my hospital should be helping people get better and not wasting their time on Facebook. Uh, it, it was an interesting insight. And even though the vast majority of people didn't fall into that category, you probably hear that uh, from people either inside or outside your organization sometimes. And, and we've seen comments, too, on hospitals, social media sites where people say, who are you? Why are you talking about this? You know, get back to business. This is not your place. So, but it is your place to put the right information out there and to put things up that validate your organization as a good place to work and a good place to, to visit if you're a patient. That, that begs the question, do we have to do this? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm afraid we, we probably do have to do this after all. And why? So, Here's another set of questions. Now we wanted to understand the, per the perception of the consumer. We wanted to understand if there was a, different, a difference when you asked them what their perception was when a hospital is just not active on social media. So what did they say? 78% said that they didn't care, basically. 78% of respondents to a specific question said they thought social presence had a neutral impact on their perception. So a lot of people, when asked in that way, said, nah, we don't care. It doesn't matter to us. Right. But then when you go back and you ask them, okay, well, what if we remove the commenting ability on a social media page so that you can't you know, go in there and leave a comment? 40, almost 35% uh, felt that that would actually have, not neutral, but a negative impact on their perception of that hospital. Yeah, so that's really interesting, too. Back to what we said a few minutes ago, um, this can be a hugely time-consuming thing. And if you are going to be active on social media, and you should be, um, you have to decide, do I leave those comments enabled or do I disable them? And this is a nice insight, too. If you turn them off, you save yourself a lot of time. But people, especially the younger generation, when they see that they're turned off, they think you have something to hide, potentially. So. Uh, having a full-time community manager is important. And by the way, that younger generation is 
going to find a way to communicate with your organization, either by commenting on social media, by chatting you, one way or another in a way that's convenient for them. They're not going to pick up the phone and call you. They're probably not going to send you an email, much less wait for you to email them back. So if you want this audience, you have to do a good job of being available to them. And this is this and what we're going to talk about on the review sites are two key places where you can do that. But you better have a dedicated community manager if you're going to be active because they don't they don't like it when you just snub them. If they put a comment up that says, hey, I'd like to know more about this subject, they expect to hear back from someone. If they don't, they get frustrated. Right. And the other part of it is that we sometimes forget that in order to perform well on social media platforms, it's not just worrying about your own content. Um, you also have to leave room to engage with other people's content. You have to go on that on that feed and whoever follows you and shows up on your feed, you you should be liking and, and speaking and leaving comments and engaging with that content um, because that's just going to help you uh, pop up in their feeds. Yeah, it has to be a conversation. It can't just be one way communication. Whoa, who are all these people? They don't look like healthcare consumers. <laughs> so let's go back. Do we have to do this? And who is it for? Man, I think we do have to do this. And I think on the consumer side, it's mostly for the younger audience and the people who are, are going to be the very near future major consumers of what we do in health and wellness. But there's another audience, too, and it's these people ominously standing over me, looking <laughs> down. Who are these guys? This is our, these are our other audiences, staff, advocates out in the community, uh, the development team for the organization, maybe the recruitment team, the leadership team, all the other people who need to feel a certain way about your, your place and your brand. And a really good place to do that is on social media. It's a good spot for brand building. It's a good spot for just some kind of straight up public relations work. It's a great place to generate some engagement and some conversations. Um, and it's an awesome way to uh, to bring some positive company culture, some uh, some rapport with the people all the way through the organization. They love to be part of something bigger and more important than themselves at an individual level. And if they see the organization represented in that way on social media, it goes a long way toward helping them feel good about what they do and, and where they do it. So, Absolutely. yes, you have yes. to do it. You gotta Sorry. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's figure out who's doing it and who's doing it right. <laughs> yeah, we thought it'd be interesting to show you a few examples, and these aren't anything that we necessarily have anything to do with, um, but we found some people who we think are doing a good job, and, and we're going to give you a couple of quick insights into why we, why we think they're doing a nice job. So here's Mayo Clinic's Facebook page. Who's that? Mayo Clinic. Never heard of them. <laughs> um, the reason that this one was selected was because, well, it is Mayo Clinic, but they have something really unique here on their page. If you notice in the left bar, they have a couple tabs that are interesting. They have Mayo Facebook pages. They have Mayo Clinic locations. They even have a Mayo Clinic in Espanol. They have multiple languages. Um, what is this, right? It's, it's the way that they're approaching it is that they're centralizing their brand. They're putting it all under one umbrella. So whether they have multiple pages, multiple locations, multiple audiences, multiple languages. And they do have all of those multiples. Right. Um, they're really maximizing Facebook's capabilities by doing it all under one page. And they may have sub-brands from there, but it's really easy as the user to go to this page and find those different sub-brands and find those locations. There's even an interactive map. Um, so that's really great, especially for big entities like Mayo. Yeah, the nuts and bolts are an important part of this. Uh, it can be a confusing place to be out on in the world of social media. And, and Mayo's doing a good job with the nuts and bolts. The other, the other question about who's doing this right or who's doing it well becomes like, what are the metrics for doing it right? Uh, the typical metrics are how many followers and how much engagement are you getting? And Mayo has massive uh, numbers there. Uh, I checked it this morning and they have on their Facebook page, this one that we're looking at right now, they have 1,133,585 followers. It's a crazy lot That's of people, a lot. <laughs> right? Just to follow a hospital or a health system. But, but is, that, is that what it is? Is that what it is? <laughs> Mayo's way more than that, right? Mayo's more of a, of a just a health 
brand in general. So they have tons of content. They're out there in the, in the community, both literally and figuratively, um, digitally. B being a provider of health and wellness information and, and being a, a thought leader and a, a literal leader in the world too. So huge engagement and, and huge validation for the Mayo Clinic as, as a brand and as a provider too. It's a good place where good things happen and that's what people are looking for. And it's a kind of place people want to work for too, by the way, back to that other audience. And I mean, but when you looked on there, was everything up to par? It, it was up to par, but that doesn't mean everybody loved it. Um, you don't have to look very hard to find negative comments immediately that pop up. Third or fourth comment on almost everything that gets much engagement is going to be somebody complaining about something. They had a bad experience. They wish something had gone differently. They're having trouble figuring out how to pay their bill. All the typical uh, issues that healthcare consumers run into. <laughs> so Mayo... Um, does a pretty good job of managing those comments run amok, but they still happen. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next section yeah. of how to manage those negative reviews. Who else is doing it well? All right. Ah, that's a <laughs> halloween -y post, too. <laughs> so here we have a post by Cedar Sina. And um, if you notice, it was only posted an hour before this screenshot was taken. But... The reason that we decided to use this as an example is because it's a good example of how to create a engaging, a simple, and eye-catching post um, without a lot of resources or too much production cost. Yeah, it's really relatable. It's a simple condition. It's not myocardial infarction or neuroscience. It's just uh, you know an everyday thing. It can be tough to stop biting your nails. Uh, this image is a great representation of current best practice in social media posts, which is something better be moving, but don't make everything move and don't just make it full motion video because the internet's bored with that. That's what we expect. So something like this that just has uh, an isolated element moving around is it does a pretty good job of getting people to stop and pay attention to what, what this message is. And it helps break up that feed when you look back at you know your Facebook page and you see a bunch of content and you yeah. have some lighter content. And these guys are doing a good job based on that other metric, which is uh, followers. They have almost 50,000 followers on their Facebook, even though they're not the Mayo Clinic. Right. Still a pretty powerful brand. <laughs> So here we have a representation, a, a screenshot of Mount Sinai on LinkedIn. And uh, and we also have a, their YouTube feed on the right. Yeah, back to the, the Pinterest example from a few minutes ago. LinkedIn is a very different thing than Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or TikTok. Definitely different than TikTok, <laughs> right? It's a different audience and it's for different kinds of messages. Uh, LinkedIn is pretty well accepted to be the place for recruitment and, and just overall branding and kind of positioning yourself as, as leaders in the space, not so much for consumers, although there is, there is a place for some of that messaging. But the point of this is these guys, Mount Sinai, are doing a good job on this platform of engaging with the right kind of content. What about their other platforms? So you see on the on the right there, you have that YouTube feed. It's interesting that the way that they have organized it, um, you see that the name of this specific list is ovarian cancer. Um, they have this across the, the channel in general. They have different categories and they, they have different content in there. And if you look at their videos, their views um, are really great. They have tons of views. They have tons of subscribers. Um, and what we really wanted to point out here is um, the great way that they have organized the page, but also what can be done with it. So you have all these videos, you utilize YouTube as the, um, the place to hold, hold and host all your videos, but then you, you have to make sure you're cross-promoting. So when you go back to their social media pages, you will see these same videos being pulled in from YouTube and promoted on their pages. And you can watch them right there on the... YouTube page, and then you can also click out. I mean, you can watch them on Facebook. Then right. you can click out to YouTube and uh, and get more of the same kind of content. And what happens behind the scenes is that while people are watching these, you're also collecting data all on that one platform. So you're understanding now some behaviors, what people are interested in, and these are going to be essential when you go back and do an advertising campaign. Mm, I love data. <laughs> data is good stuff. All right, so it sounds like we have to do social media. Yep. 
Yeah. We sure do. All right. Do we have to deal with these dumb review sites, though? Does anybody pay attention to those? This is a big time suck, right? And it's cryptic and confusing, and I don't know how they work, and I can't just write my own reviews and stick them up there, and I can't take down bad reviews even if they make me mad. And who's reviewing on what site? Where do I find it? <laughs> right. Which ones do people care about, and, and which ones don't they? It, it's, it's kind of a mess. And traditionally, we think of online reviews as uh, part of SEO, um, but really it does relate to social media as well because this is another form of engagement. Yeah, for sure. And, and people are going to communicate. They're going to be heard. And this is the way a lot of people do it, especially that younger audience. Right. So we wanted to set the stage by understanding, uh, again, the general question of do you use online review sites? This was not related to healthcare. We just wanted to understand um, the audience and their preference. Um, yeah, so do they? Yeah, 75% plus of people in this study said they use online review sites to make decisions about purchases. And we suspect in the data, the other data suggests that it, a lot of that is for restaurants and for retail and you're thinking about buying a new product, a new TV or whatever, you're going to go look at reviews. Uh, a lot of people say that they use online review sites. And this was the same across all demographics. So that nothing surprising there. So here's another question that we just wanted to get a feel for that general audience. Um, how often? How often are you leaving reviews about your experiences? Um, it's interesting here. It's enough. <laughs> I love those little nuggets of information that you see. <laughs> so while the majority were not leaving reviews as often as, as I don't know what you would, would have expected, but they're not leaving reviews very often. However, when you go to that smallest group, which is the ones that are leaving reviews at least once a week, well, guess what? Who are those? What? I don't know. They're young people? They are young people. Yeah, no surprise. <laughs> so, so that goes along with the trend of this is another place to engage. This is another two-way communication place. And, uh, and it is that younger audience that is active on it. Let me guess, they're probably leaving those reviews from their phone, right? Absolutely. And probably while they're still on the, on the property. They just had an experience, <laughs> it was either good or bad, and now they're, they're gonna leave a review. Amazing. So old people are lurkers. The older people look at the reviews, and the younger people are the reviewers. That's and the, interesting. And the future. Yeah, so. and the future for sure. I had a conversation just the other day with, with uh, one of our coworkers here, who told me that his teenage son insists on looking at reviews for every single thing. And he's not that curious about how many people reviewed it. Even if it's just a dozen people, he's still interested in what kind of reviews were left. I'm a lot more skeptical when I look at reviews. I want to have a, at least a hundred reviewers on there. I don't even put any validity in, uh, you know, the ratings or the rankings. Uh, but younger people are just really interested to see, what did somebody else say? What did they think? Um, they also really want to be heard. And did you know that being uh, an internet influencer is a job now? <laughs> it is. Look it up. <laughs> it's a thing that, that kids aspire to be now. You know, when I was a kid, everybody aspired to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or a policeman or a nurse or, or something like that. Now people aspire to be internet famous, to be an internet influencer. So we like to leave reviews because it makes us feel powerful, right? My, Mayo Clinic is a giant organization, but I, as one person, can still make a comment about Mayo Clinic, and that makes me feel important and, and powerful. Yep, that, that makes total sense. So here we're going to go shift into online reviews and how they apply specifically to hospitals and health systems. Yeah, so we asked people, we know a lot of people use review sites for other stuff, we asked them do you use review sites to research hospitals? Very specific question. Uh, and about 35% of people told us that they do use review sites to research hospitals. It's less than for retail and for some other things, uh, but it's still quite a bit of people, right? Absolutely. So do we have to? Yeah, it looks like we probably do have to. <laughs> this one is also really interesting. So when thinking about online review sites, 
um, spe specifically in our industry, in the healthcare industry. You go to conferences, you go to, you see it on webinars, you, you're getting, uh, your emails are being bombarded with these different vendors in our industries that are very specific, like ZocDoc and Factor.com, and these are big investments and conversations that you're probably having internally about where to put your money um, to be listed on these different uh, services. However, when you ask the consumer, still, 51% of them are still using Yelp, which no is way. free. <laughs> Yelp? What? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like We work in this space, and we we just assume people think like us until we stop and ask ourselves, wait, is that is that really true or not? Of course, 51% of people use Yelp, because how do they get here? They don't really Google a review site. They don't, definitely don't type in the, the URL of a review site. They probably just Google best pediatrician in Cleveland or whatever they're looking for. And what's going to come up? Yelp is going to come up, right? And when it comes up, they're not going to say, oh, wait, I don't think Yelp is for healthcare reviews. I think Yelp is only for restaurant reviews. No, they trust Yelp. It's right there on their phone. They're used to using it. They know how it works. Of course, they're going to look at Yelp. Right. Um, it's really important to think about the the mindset of these consumers when they're online and to recognize how they get to the to the things that they use to make decisions. And that doesn't take away value from the other services out there. I mean, it is valuable. It's in fact, the more that you can be on the better. But it is important to recognize that don't forget about Yelp. Don't forget about these other free services um, that are out there because people are accustomed to them. All right. So we know some people leave reviews about other experiences. Um, do they leave reviews about hospitals? Well, the truth is the majority don't. Most people are not leaving reviews, they're reading the reviews. So I don't have to do this after all? But wait a second. Oh, they are reading them though, huh? <laughs> and here we go again, the trend, 65% who answered yes, that they are leaving reviews. These are female as well. Mm -hmm. And the really scary thing about how few people leave reviews, in, in my opinion, the, the insight that I took away from this is, wow, that makes every review that I can get really important, right? If I'm getting a small number of reviewers, I better do whatever I can to generate good reviews. And since I can't just take down bad ones, I better do whatever I can to try to give people good experiences or give them some other way to talk to me uh, when they have a bad experience so that I can try to keep that off of the review sites, right? So every every review is, is pretty valuable. And an opportunity, which yeah. we're going to talk about here in a minute. Yeah. So let's talk about the importance of reviews. What's the impact that a review might have on your hospital and their choice uh, in choosing your hospital? Um, so there's pretty much a divide here. It's pretty 50-50 between who, those who feel that it's very important or important versus those who feel that it's slightly important or not important. But that's only when we ask them this very specific question, how important are online reviews when deciding which hospital to choose? So yeah, roughly 50-50. Now, when you switch that question around, when we ask them um, if there was any impact on their perception of the brand, um, if there are no reviews, 63% answered that negative reviews would affect their decision. I apologize, I said that wrong, it's negative reviews. If you're not managing your reviews, 63% would have a negative um, perception of that. So in the first question, more than half of people said that online reviews were only slightly important or not important at all. But when we asked, well, what if there are negative reviews, 63% right. said, Oh yeah, no, that that would affect me. I, if there are negative reviews, that's that's not good. And then there was another 57% that had a uh, negative perception of a hospital who has outdated information. So again, that goes back to where are you listed? Sometimes you're listed automatically uh, on different listing sites that you don't even realize. And information changes quickly in hospitals and health systems. New new doctors, new practices, new locations, things that are outdated are going to impact that perception um, of your hospital and your brand. So that number, to me anyway, speaks to the idea of validation. People are looking for validation. If they end up on a review site and it looks like this hospital that they're considering is haphazard about their digital presence, that tells them something bad about that hospital in general, right? If they're not keeping track of this, 
is this a good place for me to go or not? Right. So that doesn't even, in that case, it doesn't even matter if there are good or bad reviews or mixed reviews. Just the fact that it wasn't kept up to date, it doesn't look current, it doesn't look correct, uh, gives people a, a negative impression. So let's talk about management here. Um, let's talk about, pretty obvious, but we, it's so important, understanding the journey, understanding your patient's journey, how are they finding you, where are they looking, how are they getting to you, and how many times do they have different touch points that they, that they read about you, research you, and actually become a patient. Um, it's important to map that out and understand it so that when they reach those points, um, you're there and you're ready and you've built um, a good strategy that will help keep maintain that positive perception and, and um, strengthen your brand. Yeah, the journey goes all the way through from the tangible stuff to the advertising stuff to the word of mouth stuff and all the way to these social media sites and online review sites. Uh, you better have it all buttoned up or as buttoned up as you can because you don't know where people are going to come from and you don't really know how they're going to going to come through to make their decisions but we do know that a lot of people put a lot of value in these two things absolutely the other one here is keeping everything up to date so again we mentioned that earlier investing in a reputation management tool um, to help you manage listings is going to be really important. It's going to be a great investment. We really highly recommend it. Um, generally, they're really robust. There's some like SEMrush, WhiteSpark, Yex, Moz. We're familiar with them. Uh, maybe we, you've questioned whether or not to, to go ahead and make that investment. We definitely recommend you do, especially if you don't have an uh, outside team managing this for you. Um, why? Because it's going to help you keep your information up to date. It's also going to help you measure the sentiment across uh, the Internet uh, on those online review sites and um, help you gauge where you need to focus um, and do a little recon if you have to. Um, again, it's going to help you keep that information up to date. Um, and where they're going to tell you where because that's one of the questions is where am i listed you know how do i find that and it's really insightful when you yeah. plug it in you have to be available to to people where and when they want you um and what's this last one play offensively i thought they said the best deep the best offense is a good defense right <laughs> i think the other is also true right if you have a really good offense then you don't need as much of a defense uh, i mentioned a minute ago in talking about reviews that you need a system and you need first you need to understand the need to and then you need to set the intention to try to drive good reviews to the review sites and out there into the world in general and try to manage the bad reviews before they get out there into the world right so there are a lot of ways to do that uh, we do that for for some of the organizations we work for um, giving people a way to complain offline is is kind of a key um, and that might be as simple as being sure you send a follow-up email after someone has had an appointment at the facility that invites them. How did it go? We want to know. Here's a three-question survey. Please tell us how your experience was. If they say, it was great, I give you four out of five or five out of five stars, then give them the opportunity to immediately post that to a review site. Say, thank you. We're so glad that you had a good experience please share that with the rest of the world click here to do so and facilitate that make it really easy for them to post the good ones if on the other hand they have a one two or three out of five star experience then the response would be the opposite oh no we're sorry that you had a bad experience we'd really like to find out what went wrong and see what we can do to make it right please send an email to or please send a private message to somehow take that offline so that you can have a good conversation with them it's just good customer relations anyway, um, and it's great for your uh, your rankings online, your ratings online, because if you can solve those problems, you might be able to turn a bad rating into a good one. You get that person offline, you solve the problem, you let them feel like they were heard, assure them that it's going to go better the next time, it's going to go better for the next person, and then invite them to give you a good review instead. And this helps you stay ahead, you know, rather than wait for somebody to have a bad experience if they do. Um, and, you know, go and take it out on you online, you've already reached yep. them. Yeah, so. exactly. It's critically important. All right. But how do we know how we're doing? Um, is this another Halloween slide? <laughs> guy's got a giant uh, shadow behind him. Um, so how do we know if we're doing this stuff well and, and stuff in general? 
Well, that's another question that, that we get a lot and that we were really curious about. So now that we've talked about social media and talked about these review sites, we're going to talk just for a minute about a thing that we call the power score. So a lot of people want to know, how, how are we doing? And their bosses want to know, how are we doing? There's really no one number that tells you, how are we doing in our marketing and communications? So we decided to come up with one. Uh, the idea is to create a descriptive statistic. So take a bunch of important information and boil it down using the power of math into one number that's a useful descriptor of overall success. You can use it to benchmark, then you can use it to track, and you can also use it to see if you're making progress against, against a goal. So we created this thing we call a power score. It's a proprietary algorithm. It's based on publicly available data, which we love because that lets us run power scores for uh, competitor organizations when we're talking to our clients uh, to see how they're doing against the competition. In other words, it doesn't require anything that we can't find out just through databases we have access to or through the internet. Uh, it measures three key things. It measures reach, which is uh, done based on engagement measures like likes and follows and comments and things that are happening online on a variety of social media channels. It measures results. So we're curious about are the things that we're promising really happening? What kind of experiences are people having? So it measures results or satisfaction based on net promoter scores, ratings, those kinds of things that are happening that we have access to. But then we wanted to be able to compare dissimilarly sized organizations uh, against each other. So we put some equalization math in there too that uses some adjustment factors to, to even things out between the Mayo Clinics of the world and the, the single site providers of the world. We call it the power score just because that sounds cool, right? <laughs> to sound cool. So we took our power score on the road <laughs> all the way to Nashville. And, uh, it's a long way from here. From <laughs> When we attended uh, Shushmet this year, um, we offered those who, we had a booth there, we were exhibiting, and we spoke to a lot of healthcare um, professionals in the marketing department who came and we talked to them about our power score, and there was a lot of people who were curious um, how their health system is doing. So what we did was collect a list of all these people who were interested in finding out um, what their power score was, and um, we calculated them. Amanda did a lot of math that week. <laughs> um, so here you see in the chart, these are all the people who we spoke to who were interested, who were we were able to calculate a score for. Um, and it just, it, it ranks them, starting with um, Vanderbilt. Props to them. They did great. Um, again, this is based on a variety of factors. So we're looking at, um, you know, what the reach is, what the satisfaction is. And it is equalized. So depending on the size of their... There is no difference between the size of the entity because right. that was calculated in. Yep, it's adjusted. So why isn't Mayo Clinic up here? Well, Mayo Clinic would have definitely skewed this because they just knocked it out of the ballpark. They were at 65,000. 65,000. They would have filled this whole were, stuff. yes, um, which would have definitely uh, not given, given us such a pretty uh, a chart here. Yeah, so Mayo is the gold standard, but it's also – way more than just a hospital or a health system. It's it's a huge, powerful brand. It, yeah, it is. It's a brand, but it's also a good reminder that sometimes I know that we have these conversations about content and we think about, you know, it's, it's content is king and it has been for a little while. Is it still king? Should we still dedicate so much time into creating content? Um, and really looking at Mayo's efforts, you realize that, yeah, content is still king. Um, that's what they're doing for the most part. They're not just a brand, but they have tons and tons of content, and that's driving that's just pouring in traffic into their different channels. Um, so we definitely think that that's something to keep in mind and to continue doing if, if you're able to. So if any of you guys are going to be at HCIC next week, we're going to continue this PowerScore project there. We'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, and we're also thinking about making it available in other ways so that people can get in on this and, and so we can start to see how this really works when you have a, a large data set. Absolutely. All right, so let's sum this up here. What we learned from actually, we, we came up with these recommendations because we went and scoured the internet at the, looking at these different brands and these mm -hmm. different systems. 
Um, and one thing that um, we realized is that there are a lot of health systems out there that have different domain, I mean, they'll have different locations, but totally different domains for each of their hospitals or their locations. We, scattered, tough to, tough to understand. Absolutely. So we have the recommendation of, please, if you can, if you have the resources, try to stick to one domain. Um, why? This is going to maximize your ability to collect data and identify your audience's behaviors. You centralize your traffic, you're going to push everybody under one umbrella. Um, this is going to be really helpful later when you do advertising campaigns, um, when you want to learn about your audiences and how to target them. Um, also, you're going to leave a larger footprint on Google because you're one massive domain versus scattered, fragmented domains. Um, yeah. whether, across the board. whether you're Mayo or whether you're way smaller than that, um, this is a way to maximize the power of your brand online. Absolutely. By having an organized situation. Um, Another really critical thing to, to recognize is keep an eye on things, right? Like check your links regularly. Make sure that everything is working. It's easy to, to set things up and push go, uh, build a website and launch it, and then nobody's in charge of looking at it ever again. Uh, the worst thing that you can have happen is have dead links. You drive somebody to that information that they want. They want to have a conversation. They click it and it gives them a 404 error, sends them into the abyss. They're not going to work very hard to come back around and try to find you. It's just like if you were in a coffee shop and somebody wanted to have a conversation and you just walked out on them. Um, it's the worst thing that can happen. And also make sure that you're keeping up with the times on the Internet. Like, do you know that Google Plus is obsolete? This is a challenge for everybody on here. Please <laughs> check your website and see if you have Google Plus still listed as one of your social channels. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. It's out there, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, Google Plus is not around anymore. So keep an eye on those things. Just mm -hmm. It's the basic nuts and bolts. Have some regular check-ins. And the last one on here is become a powerhouse. What are we talking about? Well, remember we talked about Facebook and how Mayo was using it earlier? That's a powerhouse. You want to make sure you centralize your social media um, rather than have pages for each individual location managed by different groups and different teams. Centralize that, utilize Facebook Business Manager. It's there for you um, as an advertiser and as a brand and an entity, you have the ability to use, to use it. And what it does is that it just centralizes everything so that it's really easy um, to manage all the different pages under one brand. Also, it's really easy internally to give tasks to your team and allow them to manage different parts of um, if you have different pages and so on, but it all falls under one umbrella. Also from the outside, it allows for more of a cohesive experience. So you have a single brand um, and that's really important when, when you look at a brand from the outside and, and you know, the experience that you're going to have. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the fundamental thing for branding, right? Be consistent, be available, um, give people an experience that they understand. And then the other part of it is, again, just like Google, what it does is that if you have everything under one umbrella, you're also collecting um, insights about your audiences wherever they are across your different channels or your different pages. So that's going to be really helpful when you go back and you do those targeted ad campaigns. Yeah, the more you can know about your audience and where they are and what they want and how they're coming to you, the better, uh, the more efficient you can be with everything that you do, not just social media and, and review sites. Absolutely. All right. We learned a lot from this study. Um, we always come up with more questions than we have answers when we run one of these, and this was no exception to that. There's some other things that we want to dig, dig into a little bit more deeply, uh, but we did find out some, some interesting things. I think we found some outliers that offer opportunities. Hopefully, you guys benefited from some of that, too, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to break the news to you, but we can't tell you that you don't have to do social media. We can't tell you that you don't have to pay attention to review sites. They are both really important. And who are they mainly important for? Remember about the future because there is that audience out there, that 18 to 29 year old aged uh, age group that is, is not only on there, but they're expecting to communicate with you and have that ability to communicate themselves. Yeah, and they're gonna be making decisions about their own health and their family's health care for a long, long time. And by the way, uh, some of those 20 something kids that I uh, that I mentioned earlier might be making decisions for me before too long. <laughs> so 
uh, remember your audience and remember that it's the young people. And that's all oh, we have. I know we, we, we bumped <laughs> up against the, the time crunch. <laughs> Yes, thanks, Amanda and Craig. It's a great presentation. Um, we have time for just a few questions, uh, so we'll get started right away. Um, our first question is, is it always appropriate for the hospital to show lighter content on social, such as the example in the slide of the person biting nails, considering that many followers may be patients dealing with serious health issues? You know, it's a really good question. Um, the answer, the simple answer is no, it's not always appropriate. But in our experience, there is a place for that, even in the world of healthcare. And you, you can't make fun of health conditions, and you certainly wouldn't want to uh, wouldn't want to minimize the impact of serious health conditions. But there is a place, and there is an audience for some of that kind of messaging. That's about more everyday things, uh, more relatable, more lifestyle kind of stuff. What do you think? Yeah, and looking at what people are searching for when they're looking on uh, the different social media channels, and one of those slides we had a graph about what they're interested in, um, a lot of the stuff that they're looking for is lifestyle, is a little lighter. Um, so th I, I would say that there's definitely room for it. Um, but again, that's a very good point. There are people, you are going to have that audience on there that is is very serious because they are facing something that is weighs a lot more than... One of the... Uh... One of the things that we do for, for our clients, and it's just a current best practice, is to create uh, a calendar, a, a plan. You have to plan this content, and there's room for a variety of content types. And if you have a, an organized approach to it, you can put the more serious things up at certain on certain days or at certain intervals, and you can put some lighter stuff and, and weave that in with it. Uh, and you can create a broader story than just a thing that's about serious health conditions. And remember that there's different channels too, so it's all about right. what channel you're yeah. on and what's appropriate. Yeah. All right, and, and so how would you manage your review responses in regards to HIPAA? How would you manage, well obviously you can't use any proprietary protected health information, so you would never use a person's name. Um, typically, the advice when you get a bad review, and I assume that's probably what uh, the questioner is wondering about, would be to invite that reviewer to take the conversation offline uh, so that you could have a private conversation with them that wouldn't violate any HIPAA rules. Yeah, usually the, yep. And uh, one other question, and I know we are running over a little bit, so if people have time to stay for a few minutes, that'd be great. Um, how do you add a, a new different or newer different link to the left Facebook navigation bar list like you showed for Mayo? And is that a technical question that <laughs> I should get answered somewhere else? Or? That's, a, well, <laughs> that's a real inside baseball kind of a question. I, I, I like it though. That somebody's paying attention. I'm going to answer that as a marketer. Um, you can give us a call and I can jump on a go-to meeting and show you. I would be more than happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's definitely Facebook Business Manager on the back end, and that's where you're going to find those kind of features. Facebook has good tutorials too, so we would love it if you if you want to give Amanda, drop Amanda a <laughs> note, and she'd be happy to walk people through it. Um, and Facebook does have really good tutorials built in, and that Business Manager is a, a strong tool. Great. Okay. And um, what would you recommend for social media? What should be done in-house? What should be outsourced to an agency? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we usually think of social media content in, in like a three-stage process. There's the high-value stuff, the mid-value, and then just the kind of quick hit, lower, lower value things. And the production value aligns with the value of the post, too. So typically, we set it up so that we're creating the the higher value things, that would be a fully produced video, something with motion graphics, uh, maybe it's an interview, a quick interview with a patient or uh, a doctor talking about some serious health condition, uh, something that needs more production and therefore more lead time and more planning. And then the medium value things might be a, a topical piece that's a little simpler but still takes some strategic thinking and some time. Um, the New York Marathon is coming up this weekend and we've done some posts for some clients around that. So that's a, a geographically specific event, and it takes a, a specific kind of a voice and the right kind of images. That would be a medium, 
medium value asset in our opinion. And then we always create room for people to plan those other things that they can do really organically and in the moment within some guardrails. So if you set up that that uh, content calendar, you have a grid that plans out what's going to happen, you should leave some room in there um, and maybe even create some templates. There are lots of great tools. Canva is one of them that a lot of people use uh, where you can set up some branded templates and make sure that when the, the person on the client side is going to do a post on their own, that it looks right and it, it sounds right. Um, and, and we provide guidance on hashtag strategies and how to, how to use the right kind of tone and then we just turn people loose. And well, and then there's the other part of it that is very valuable, and we mentioned it earlier, is that we do think it's important to have somebody on the inside um, who is monitoring that communication. Dedicated part. to it. Yeah, you, you should have somebody who knows your brand, who's inside your brand, who can go and jump and run and talk to a doctor, or whatever the issue might ar that might arise, um, who's sitting there and, and engaging with conversations, with PEs, um, and those people who are chatting um, through these pages. So that's definitely something that you, you want to consider. Great, okay. Um, one other question. Do you suggest personalizing your review response if they leave their name, or should you use a canned response? Um, yes. <laughs> you can do either of those things. Um, canned responses usually feel canned, and if people start investigating, they're going to click through and see the same response over and over, which um, it seems very impersonal and disingenuous because, frankly, it kind of is. Um, I'm not personally a big fan of canned responses in any situation other than just the most general one, but having planned responses is a different thing. Like when we get these kinds of, con of comments, how are we going to reply? Uh, so loosely scripted and planned out anticipated responses. And I just thought of that phrase, planned responses versus canned responses. <laughs> you should write, you should write that down. Um, having a plan for those responses is important. I'm not personally a fan of the canned responses, though, because uh, they give you away almost immediately. I would have to agree. And, and, and again, as you plan those responses out, you're definitely going to have some sort of best practice or, or guide for whoever is responding so that they are aware that they should touch on this and that and yeah. invite that conversation outside and they can follow that format. Yeah, it's more of a rubric for how to reply than it is a, a literally a canned response for each possible thing. Great. And one final question. How can I get my power score? <laughs> well, you have to have a hospital first. I don't, do you have a hospital? No, I'm kidding. Um, Me personally, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> I will, uh, I will, at the risk of blowing up the rest of Amanda's week, I will say, uh, if you'd like your power score run, you can hit our website at wax, waxcom.com and find us on the contact page there. Tell us the name of your organization and say you'd like your power score and we will happily run a power score and send it back to you. If you're going to be at HCIC, just drop by the booth with all the monster stuff in it, and uh, and we'll talk to you there and maybe even run a power score right there in the moment. Great, thanks. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for questions, so thank you, Amanda and Craig, for sharing this very valuable information, and thank you, attendees, for contributing great questions to the Q&A today. And a big thank you to Wax Custom Communications for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, one hey. final reminder, uh, look for an email with a link to the presentation slides immediately following the webinar, and we'll send a link to access the webinar recording as soon as it's been processed and it's available for viewing. So thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.